I want to take a few minutes today to uh, answer a couple of questions. Uh, I'm not going to be able to answer a couple. I'm going to talk about the Godhead. Um, I received some questions. Uh, one was about Christian burial. Burial or cremation was the question. And I was going to answer that today, but really, we're, uh, next week I'll have to do that. But then there's questions about the Godhead, about the breaking of bread. That's the second time I get this question recently because I received it from, uh, I received it from uh, uh, people in Colorado and also the people from India about breaking of bread. Where does that fit into the dispensation of grace today? That's a, that's a whole message all by itself, all right? And then also, what happens to nominal Christians who do not accept Paul's gospel? All right, that's from the people in India. And also, to complete our salvation, do we have to bring others to the knowledge of this gospel? And they don't mean to complete their salvation as though they're not saved. That's not what they're, that's not what they're asking. But I will explain that also uh, next week. But I want to talk about the Godhead. And open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. The Godhead in the Word of God has to do with the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There are cults that don't believe in a triune God. They actually have a doctrine called the Oneness Doctrine. And in this doctrine, they teach that when God created the heaven and the earth, that there was no Jesus Christ and there was no Holy Spirit. They teach that when Jesus Christ was on the earth, there was no God in heaven and there was no Holy Spirit. And they teach that now that the Holy Spirit is, on, is here, there is no God in heaven and there is no Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. So just imagine the spiritual gymnastics that these people have to get involved in to say those kinds of things, okay? I mean, you want to talk about perverting the Word of God. All right, that's like the nth degree of perversion. The doctrine of the Godhead is a central doctrine in the Christian faith in order for you to understand the redemption that you have in Jesus Christ. It is not a passing doctrine. It is a central message of the Word of God. Okay, And without this doctrine, this book, this Bible, becomes just another religion in the world with millions of gods or no gods or this oneness thing, okay? We'll talk about how the Godhead has to do with our redemption in a few moments, but in Genesis chapter 1 is the first time we're introduced to the, the concept of a Godhead. It's the first time. As God opens up his Bible, as God opens up the Word of God, he is going to tell you that there is a Godhead. All right, now in Genesis chapter 1, verse 25. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our image. And our first introduction to the Godhead is that the Godhead is a plurality. It is not a one thing. It is one God manifested in three persons. Like, for example, you have one hand. Well, you have two hands, but let's just put one behind your back, okay? You have one hand with five fingers, one God with three people. It's a composite of a whole that has individual parts to it. 
your hand really is like a picture of the Godhead. You belong to one family, your own individual family. But there are members in that family. But it's one family. It's the father, it's the mother, it's the children. Many parts, but one family, right? So the Godhead is one manifested in three individual persons, Genesis 3.22. Genesis 3.22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And again, God identifies himself not as me, the man has become like me, he's become like one of us, the Godhead. So God doesn't use these words because he doesn't know what he's talking about. God's own testimony concerning himself and the terminology that he uses in the very beginning establishes this very fact, that God is a plurality. Okay? And that's very important. Because if you can't get that, there's no way you can understand the Godhead. The Godhead is complicated enough to begin with. But turn to 1 John. 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. Right before the book of Revelation. Well, first... 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Jude. 1st John, chapter 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and that is in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. It's, it's clear, isn't it? It's clear. 1 John 5, 7. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. Now, since God is one, manifested in three persons, how does this triune God function in your redemption, in your salvation, in the world today? Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, there, the first chapter has three distinct sections in it. Each of the section addresses a unique work that each person of the Godhead will accomplish in the redemption of mankind. Verses 1 through 6 deal with the Father. Verses 7 through 12 deal with the Son. And verses 8 through 14, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, 12 through 14 deal with the Holy Spirit. Each of these three individual sections ends with to the praise of his glory. For example, notice verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace. And then notice verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory. And then notice verse 14 which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Each of these sections, the first section, verses 1 through 6, is the, deals with the will of the Father. The next section, verses 7 through 12, is the work of the Son. And then verses 12 through 14 is the witness of the Spirit. These three passages of Scripture... These three sections of scripture, although don't use the word triune God, they are explaining 
the triune God. For example, the first sections, verses 1 through 6, are the work or the will of the Father. All right? Notice verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. In the beginning, before the beginning of the universe, before angels were created, before the universe was created, when only God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit existed in eternity past, they held a council. The Father planned out and mapped out a time, a period of time, which is Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, is the beginning of time, and then all the way till the end of Revelation chapter 22, when time ends and we go back out into eternity. But time itself, in the beginning to the very end, the reason that time was created was to measure the duration of created things. That's the only reason time exists, okay? Time exists like a capsule in the midst of all of eternity. Before time began, eternity went all the way into the past. When time ends, eternity will go all the way into the future. But time was designed to measure the duration of created things and so that we could know that there is a time frame and that there is a timeline that you and I can look in the Word of God and say, we are right here in this timeline right now. That's why God created time. Well, before he created time, God the Father had a council. And in this council, they made an arrangement and an agreement how man was going to be redeemed in this thing that he would create called the universe. And in there, the earth. And on there, man. In a garden. Okay? And so in this, in this pre-universe time, like he says in verse 4, hath chosen us before the foundation of the world, the will of the Father was established. God's will was established. And at that time, there was a secret that they said, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit said, there's one thing we're going to keep secret. And it will only be revealed one day out there in due time when we want it revealed. And that's the dispensation of grace that you and I live in today, which in other ages was not made known unto the children of men as it is now made known unto you. So that's verses 1 through 6 speaks of the will of the Father in eternity past, that he planned out and mapped out everything that you and I and that Israel would have to do and what we have to do and on and on and on. The next section, verses 7 through 12, are the work of the Son. Notice verse 7, in whom, and verse 6 ends with, accepted in the beloved, being accepted in Christ by God, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Through his blood is the work of the cross where Jesus Christ died for you, was buried, was raised again from the dead, according to the scriptures, for our justification. And in verses 6 through 12, 7 through 12, we have the work of the Son, not only in redemption, but what his work did to reconcile the whole universe together at the end of time. So the work of the Son is not just the cross that saves you now. The work of the cross will reconcile everything in one, and Jesus Christ will be the head over all over Israel on the earth throughout eternity and the body of Christ in the heavens, we're all going to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. That's the work of the Son. 
So in verses 1 to 6, you have the will of the Father. In verses 7 to actually uh, 11, you have, uh, in verse 12, 7, 12, the work of the Son. And then verses 13 and 14, you have the witness of the Spirit. And what happens is, in verse 13, in whom ye also trusted in Christ, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, here comes the work of the Holy Spirit. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And each member of the triune God had a part in your redemption. The Father planned it. The Son executed it. And the Holy Spirit seals it for you. All three of them work in conjunction with each other. Here's the bottom line. You sinned against God. You, the Son came and died for you. When you trusted him, the Holy Spirit came and sealed you. That's the work of the triune God in your redemption. That's why you cannot understand redemption apart from a clear understanding of the triune God. Each member of the Trinity has done something specific for you. And it happened in eternity past with the will of the Father. It was executed in present time in the death of his Son. And it was sealed by the Holy Spirit. And that's what takes you, notice verse 14, that the Holy Spirit is the earnest. He's the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. In other words, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Notice Ephesians 4.30. Notice verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. That work of the Holy Spirit takes you from this time now all the way out forever. You're sealed forever. There's the doctrine of eternal security for you. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's a done deal, but it's the Holy Spirit's job to do that for you. God planned it. The son died. He keeps it real and forever for you. That's why you need all three members of the triune God in your salvation. That's why you need them. Amen? Amen. Now, there were several other questions. I can't get into them. It's almost 1230. You know. But... Uh, Next week, I want, you know, I know I'm doing this thing on the, the Christian in complete armor. I'm going for that. I mean, we're finishing that. Then we're going to go finish Romans 5. But these people are asking these questions, okay? And these are important questions. I mean, the, the, doc, you know, the thought of Christian burial. Burial or cremation? Which is right? Well, what does the Bible say? Does the Bible say it doesn't matter? <laughs> well, no, it, the Bible talks about, I think the Bible talks about both subjects very clearly. But we can't talk about it right now. Sorry, Mary. <laughs> Sorry, we, we can't get into it right now. But next week, here's what I would like to do. Roxy has an iPad. And I want to do a testimony with Roxy. Because she has some interesting things about where she came from, about what she was involved in, and why she had completely given up on God and on religion. Well, not God. She didn't give up on God. Religion, she gave up on. Because it produced more confusion for her, and she really thought there was no answer <laughs> until she found out about the Word of God, rightly divided, and changed her life. Okay, so next week, Roxy, and then the people from Colorado. You saw what we did today. I don't know if I need to get better speakers to get a clearer sound. Maybe we have to do that. Those aren't the best speakers in the world. But maybe we need to get, like, some really good speakers that produce a nice, clear sound. You know, because we know when we tried to play Roxy's music on there, it was horrendous. You know, it didn't come out clear and... So maybe we need to do something like that. 
but I want you people to email me who have iPads because you know what? Your, your fellowship with us, like you saw today, it's live. It's live. And it's in real time. You know, I mean, I'm talking, they're hearing me right away. They're talking, we're hearing them right away. The delays on the internet, they, they only hear it a few seconds later, but they don't know that it's not in real time. So well, I'd like to plan things like this because it's an encouragement for us. And we'll have, you know, we can have some of you come up and share your testimony so they can all get it. Like we're getting theirs, let's get yours. Because these are times of encouragement. You know, Paul talked about going from city to city, confirming the souls of the disciples. What he was confirming in them was, you made the right decision. You're doing the right thing. And he'd tell them about the brethren over there. And then he'd hear about the brethren in Colossae, when I heard of your faith in Christ. And he talks about the Ephesians, when I heard about your faith in Christ. Oh, it's part of it. Our testimonies, our sharing the reality of what you now know and understand about the Word of God. It's encouraging to others. Amen? Yes. So start planning out your testimonies. And I'm going to be leaving in three weeks to go to a conference in Ohio. And uh, you still on? Not ready. Okay. David's going to be sharing his testimony on Sunday morning when I'm gone, and uh, he's going to be playing my guitar and leading the singing and everything. <laughs> I heard he's even bringing a saxophone. I don't know. <laughs> he's going to bring Richie. Mm -hmm. Richie's going to bring his uh, saxophone. Richie's going to do sign language. <laughs> okay. All right. So, folks, listen. The doctrine of the Godhead, as you can see, plays a vital place in your redemption, and in your salvation. Amen? Amen? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Our gracious God and our Father, we're so thankful this morning that we could get together with our brethren from India and hear about their salvation and what they came out of and how that they, they found us and how that they understand Paul's gospel and how excited they are about the word of God rightly divided. What an incredible blessing that was to hear from them and to to share with them and to have them share with us. I'm, my heart is truly blessed today, as I know it is for everyone that heard this today. And I pray that with this new technology that we can fellowship with more people around the world and around the country in Colorado and Virginia and Pennsylvania and wherever our brethren are gathered right now, that they will get themselves iPads, at least an iPad too. <laughs> and uh, we can encourage and bless each other in a way that's never been possible before. So we thank you, Lord, again for the great salvation that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're thankful that God the Father planned it, the Son executed it, and the Holy Spirit seals it. And we're thankful for all these things. In that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.